launching point, uh, we're going to give you some examples of ways that bus drivers might nurture relationships. You might um, introduce a way to teach expectations on the bus, how you might use positive language in that setting, and how you might promote positive behavior. But I also want to say, since you are the directors, this, these same techniques could be used for you on the bus trip. And then the bus drivers could use the same techniques on kids. Okay, so I told her a few things, okay? <laughs> All right, okay. So, so wouldn't these same bus drivers love to have a nurturing relationship? And wouldn't they feel so much better if they had this great toolbox full of skills and they knew how to handle the kids on the bus? And, and wouldn't it feel better to be at your job when you were handing out tons of high fives every day instead of just waiting for the next disaster to happen on the bus. Um, all of these things are things that you as supervisors can also implement for adults because even though it's good for kids, it's also good for grown-ups too. So when we first started doing this, they said, okay, go home. When we were talking about puzzle language, like practice on your husband. So I did it, and the first thing Jared said, he said, what did I do wrong? <laughs> like, oh, I'm so sorry, you're so used to negative attention. <laughs> so, for the nurturing, so for nurturing relationships, that's where we're going to kick off. Everybody needs somebody who's crazy about them. And you truly have no idea what's going on in these children's lives at home. It could be a mess. Their parents could be fighting. They could be in the middle of a divorce. You know, there could be drugs, alcohol. There could be somebody who's not giving them any attention. And even though it seems minor, if you have one person who's crazy about you, it makes all the difference in the world. And it, it could be one of the bus drivers. It truly could be. So in terms of nurturing relationships, we're going to get into more of these examples. Because the thing about the pyramid is these all weave together to kind of build that foundation. But what if buses came up with a bus name? So instead of being just bus 26 or whatever, what if that team atmosphere was fostered by being the penguins or the tigers or whatever the kids want to pick to be your name? That builds a sense of community. It builds the bus driver into that sense of the community. So they're no longer, they're no longer the bad guy monitoring them and and making them do things. It's, we're all penguins together. We are that group. Um, golden tickets or some kind of reward system where bus drivers have a stack of these tickets to give out at will. So all those little kids who are sitting on the bus following the rules, who, 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 thank you so much. You did an awesome job today. I noticed. I was watching you in my mirror and I saw. That makes kids feel so good, and you're rewarding the positive behavior. And guess what? The kids who traditionally don't have that kind of behavior, they want it. They want it a lot. And they're willing to work to get it. Um, high five, smiles, thumbs up, any kind of gesture with your body to just let someone know, I noticed. I noticed that you were working hard. Um, Vanessa and I have been talking about something when new bus drivers come on. We can help, or the pyramid you know, would promote something where you're sending an email. Maybe they, we help you draft a video, but maybe you send something that says, Hey, I'm Brooke. I'm going to be your bus driver this year, and I'm so excited. And we're going to get to come up with a bus name, and I want you to be thinking about it, because we're going to come up with a group name, and here's what I want you to know about me, or whatever. But a lot of information can be shared ahead of time with kids so they already feel like they have a little bit of a relationship with you before they even get going the first time they step on the bus. And even little check-ins. The bus is busy. I know they don't have time to be sitting here having in-depth conversations with kids, but there's no reason why bus drivers couldn't, you know, did you have a thumbs up day today? Thumbs up? You know, as they come up, oh, you said, that's a kid I want to check in with a little bit later and find out why they had a thumbs up day. Maybe there's something they can do to help. Maybe they're nervous to go home because they got a really bad report on the, from their teacher or they got moved to the, what is got it? Moved to yellow. They got moved to for yellow talking. for talking and they're scared to tell their parents because maybe they're going to get in trouble and there's something he can or she can just say to help um, process that um, emotional support. 
So this, and is, I, does this pour off of like PBS type of structure in some way because of people? Yes, it's and some of pop, totally positive. Yes. Um, and the uh, attending IEP goals, I know that's something maybe that you've already wanted to do, but I do think it is a fabulous way to connect with families, mm -hmm. um, be part of that group, and and really as you go around the other administrators and teachers that you are considered a teacher. You are. And and those kinds, of, being at those meetings just kind of um, gives you that credentialing and that respect as being someone else who's being a teacher for kids for a certain time period. So the other thing we wanted, the other section is about teaching expectations. So if we're all bought into drivers are teachers, then this is a great place for them to teach certain skills that kids are going to use their whole life. Um, and the things that you could teach specifically would be, what are the rules on the bus? Does everyone agree on the rules of the bus? Could we all pick three, four rules? Every bus has the same rules. And it's not, when Vanessa drives the bus, she wants me to do X, Y, and Z. And when I drive the bus, eh, I don't really care about those, but I want you to do A, B, and C. If it's consistent for kids, they're more likely to follow the rules. When things change, it gets very difficult for kids to manage um, and process that. It takes them a lot longer to figure it out. And because they can't figure it out, they're more likely to just say, eh, forget it, I think I'm going to jump up and down with my seat. Because that was too hard. Uh, volume level, you know, we can introduce some phrases for all the buses. So the bus drivers have ways to monitor the volume level and get people to change the volume level. And the routine. What are the routines? When, when they get on and off the bus, what are they expected to do? When they sit on the bus, are there certain places they need to sit or can't sit or whatever? I don't know. That's your area of expertise. But those are the kinds of things you can be thinking about. What's something every kid needs to know? And you can teach these skills using visual cues, puppets, um, scripted stories, games. There's myriads of ways that are interesting to kids and aren't just sitting there like I'm doing to you today, just blabbing. Um, so what, let's look at some examples. So what if something like this for behavior expectations was posted on your bus? I face forward with my body. I don't need to know how to read to figure out what these kids are doing. I keep my hands to myself. This picture only shows hands. There's nothing else confusing about it for kids to get confused of what that might mean. I use a quiet voice to talk. I don't know if those are your three rules, but I just made them up for an example. But if those were big and posted on the bus, Every child would know exactly what's expected of them, and we don't have to know, stop, and don't them. We can say, I remember we're keeping our hands to ourselves. Thank you guys for keeping your hands in your lap. That's a great place to do this. It's super simple and motivating for kids. And it's also a nice way to keep your bus drivers on track with what the rules are. So it's kind of expanding the social, the social stories that we like to use for our children. Autism and expanding it Absolutely. to a grand In scale. fact, a lot of the pyramid was based off of LEAP, which LEAP is a, um, a program for teaching um, kids with autism in an integrated classroom. But what they found when they integrated LEAP into the classrooms was it was amazing for every kid in there. And so visual schedules and visual cues are one of the things that was originally thought, oh, only kids with autism need it, but they found out that it was amazing for every kid and helped them stay on track. So this could be something like about tra that transition piece of getting on board. You know, I wait my turn to get on the bus. I get on one at a time. I cross in front of the bus. Whatever your rules are, but if there's pictures, kids get it. This might be an example of something for your volume control. Maybe <laughs> general, it's okay for kids good. to have That's good. cat voices, but maybe when you approach the railroad tracks, we need mouse voices. Or maybe there's a time when you let them have a lion voice. I tell my kids all the time, if you see a ceiling, we're using a mouse voice, cat voice. If we go outside and you see the clouds, you pull out your lion voice, go for it, go for it. But maybe there's a time when you let them roar for whatever reason. Because, too, if you think about that, when you tell a child, be quiet, what, it, what does quiet mean? I mean, really, when they're, you know, even five and six, I mean, 
quiet is a, a hard concept to get, and maybe quiet to me doesn't mean the same quiet to Brooke. So Absolutely. really giving them a visual. You can think about families that you go visit. I go to some people's houses and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so loud here. I'm having trouble focusing. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that was quiet to them, but it's not quiet to me. So, and I think when you, when you, when you want kids to always be in a certain place all the time, you need to give them an opportunity to do this. Um, so when can they have a loud voice? Maybe you build that into your schedule. When I open the door and we say goodbye to all the kids, you know, we're like, bye, Johnny, or something. There's an outlet for them so they know they can wait, 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 I get it. And then I'll wait, 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 I get it. So. Oh. Um, Vanessa has some examples, but it sounds like maybe you're already using social stories. But social stories are a great way to front load those expectations for kids before they get on the bus. So there's some like generic ones that are online that you can already use with cartoons. Um, and then I just kind of like, I don't know if you, when they start the bus and they pay that fee to ride, we're thinking maybe you could send that with that new kindergartner that's going to start riding. But I'll just read it to you and then we can pass it along. And if you guys want to keep it, you're more than welcome to. But I made it kind of like a comic book strip. Um, I stay back from the yellow and black. I stay safe. I say hello to my bus driver and check in. Thumbs up for a good day. Thumbs down for a bad day. I sit with my back against the seat facing forward, I'm a super rider. I'm quiet as a mouse so I can listen for the trains at the railroad tracks. We get to school, I take my turn to get off. Safe and slow is the best way to go. If I need to cross the street, I remember to cross and view is the safe thing to do. So, and then I just made another little booklet. Maybe you have that another kiddo who's having a hard time and this is an actual like book thing that they could look at. So we'll pass those around. So like I use, I teach toddlers and two, three and girls, and it's often the very first time they've ever come to school. So we have a social story. They get it before they even come to a drop-in day at my class. It's exactly what we do every single day in our routine, and it's a little cartoon for them to, to read with their family at home. So by the time they even step foot in my classroom, they already feel a little bit comfortable. They know kind of what to expect, and they know kind of what I want them to do. So, same thing for the bus. Um, yeah, so the, the important thing to know about social stories is they're written from the perspective of the child. And they tell them what they can do in specific detail. And they always float in that, like Vanessa said, I'm a, what you say? A super, super rider. I'm a super rider. <laughs> I mean, you always float those things in to reinforce that positive piece. So you want them to choose the positive. So the positive language thing is probably, like I said, one of the most important pyramid concepts you can have. We call it five to one emotional deposits, but you can think of it like a piggy bank. If I want to reprimand Johnny for what he's doing on the bus, I should have praised Johnny at least five times before I did this. If, same thing for the parents. If I want to tell Johnny's mom that he did not have the best day on the bus, I hopefully have already told Johnny's mom five times what an amazing job he's done. It takes five deposits to equal one withdrawal emotionally. And that's kind of what we work on. Um, catching them being good. We're going to give so much attention for positive behavior. And when we see inappropriate behavior, obviously if it's a safety hazard, we're not going to ignore it. But we're going to ignore or just redirect behavior that's not going the way we want. If somebody's, you can see someone's grabbing to them, the bus driver might point to the, or refer back to the rules um, that are posted. I remember we keep our hands to ourselves, or I remember we're using our cat voices. They're just kind of redirecting them back to what they want them to remember. I think something, we use a phrase in school, and I modified it a little bit for you guys. I think bus drivers could have some sort of positive phrase, like safety check, hey penguin, safety check. Um, let's remember what our three rules are. If you see, you know, if they see it starting to swell out of control, or people are making bad choices, safety check is a great way. We use, it, we use body check in school, you know, because kids are touching each other, getting out of line. Body check, what are, what's your body supposed to be doing? Could be the same kind of concept for the bus. Safety check, what am I doing to make sure I'm safe? I need to have my seat and my, my butt in my chair, my hands in my lap, and whatever, quiet voices. 
And then that same piece with the parents. Hopefully we're giving really great feedback. Like yesterday, I have a girl who's having some problems in class. It's hard for her to share. So last night I fired off an email to her mom. You wouldn't believe what a great job she did today, taking turns with these dresses that are so important to her. Just, I'm loading up mom, so the next time I have to tell her something bad, it isn't so devastating. Because you don't know what happens to these kids when the bus drivers give negative feedback to these parents. You don't know what happens at home. It might be scary for these kids what happens, truly. So, if we front-loaded it, maybe when they get some bad news, it's not so difficult to swallow. So if we kind of looked at how you might make over the language, it might be something like where we replace no, stop, and don't with what children can do. So instead of saying, hey, don't get out of your seat while the bus is moving, we say, hey, shark, safety check. We stay safe and we keep our bottoms in our seats. We can switch seats at the next stop. Tell them when they can do it. I don't know, maybe they can switch at the next stop. But you know what I'm saying? You tell them when they can do the next thing. Um, referring to the visual cues, kids forget all the time. They're kids. And the younger they are, the more they forget, and the longer it takes them to process what was said. So if you have pictures of they can process it a lot faster. Stop talking so loud. But kids don't really know what to do, right? So, hey, tiger, I see the arrows on the cat voices. Next stop, let's all give a big tiger roar to celebrate our hard work. Something that just tells them, we're not using that voice right now, but we can use it in a little bit. One of the things I think people tend to do is they're always calling out the kids who are not engaging. They're giving them attention, and they're doing it in front of their peers. So really the goal is to get the group to come back to this without singling out an individual child. Because believe it or not, the peers are picking up on that every time bus driver hollers at Johnny 20 times a day. They start to get in their mind like, Johnny's a troublemaker. I probably don't want to be friends with him. And sorry, just take me back a little bit. Sure. Something I deal with a lot we were talking about when you call parents and a lot of times you don't know what's going to end up happening to that student. Um, the parents could be really supportive. They could be overly supportive to the fact that the kid might get spanked. You never know, you know. Uh, you worry about, you could already hear the parent get mad and you don't want to cause any anguish. And, but a lot of times I see it go the other way too where you can tell that the parents are not supportive. They're not on your side and you can see where these behaviors are coming from. What's your best approach to go about that with those students where there's no structure at home? There's no structure in the family. You it's could really tell it, you could feel their son or daughter doesn't do anything wrong. How, you know, without physically talking to that student, mentoring, helping them, how do you go about that? Well, that seems to be the hardest part that I have, because there's not the support at home. Well, the positive language piece goes a long way. So if you're giving specific feedback, and I'm not, when I say positive language, I don't mean just good job. Because what a good job. I mean, Johnny has no idea what he did that was good. So giving specific feedback and sharing it with the parents, I think, is really important. Johnny did such a great job today because he sat in his seat the entire time I was driving the bus. Or Johnny used his cat voice the entire time. It's almost up to us, in a way, to role model these skills for the parents. I mean, we're not going to change what the parents are doing at home. But I do have to tell you that I have lots of kids that are in that same situation. And kids are adaptable, and they're super smart. And I bet Everett and Gus know that what they can do at your house, and what they can do at <laughs> Vanessa and Jared's house. I knew this was going to go bad. <laughs> kids know. I know that the kids come into my classroom, and the things they do for me, it does not happen at home. So it is a hard conversation to have when you know you're not going to get backed up. But that's kind of the whole beauty of the pyramid model, is I don't need, I mean, it's amazing when parents buy into it and they add on to it. The effect is quadruple. But if they don't, I don't need them in my little bubble because I'm managing my bubble of my classroom or my bus so positively, so well, that Johnny, probably what you're going to see is when Johnny's at home, it's not super positive. It's not something that he looks forward to. Um, but when he goes on the bus and he gets a lot